As a Singaporean, I'm very excited to be stepping outside of my day-to-day -day responsibilities and hosting this panel. Uh, we're going to do about 30 minutes of just us chatting amongst ourselves, and then we'll open it up for 15 minutes of questions at the end. Uh, bring all of your tough questions. Uh, we'd love to answer them. Okay, without further ado, can I get each of you to say a little bit about your name, what you do, and something that you've worked on over the past year? Um, hi, uh, my name's Hong, uh, and I run the Open Government Products team at GovTech. Uh, and what we do is we, like, we're a small sort of like experimental team which proactively identifies things that we think the government should be doing. Uh, we build prototypes around it, and then we go try to evangelize those things within the government and get agencies and stuff to adopt technology in areas where we think it could do better. Uh, one of the things we've been working on recently is uh, Forms SG, which is basically a Google Forms uh, sort of duplicate for the government. Um, so the basic problem is that, you know, the, the government has a lot of paper, as with most governments. Um, and the reason for this is because in order to digitize a single uh, service in the government, it takes a long sort of bureaucratic process of having to procure vendors and build things. It takes like a few months uh, and like quite a few thousand dollars to digitize even a single form. Forms SG is like Google Forms where you self-service and build it, except unlike Google Forms, it is built in a sort of like secure manner where we use public-private key encryption so that every single submission is encrypted on the server and only decrypted by the form creator. That way you don't have this big juicy target of like information for people to hack. Um, and yeah, the goal is that by the end of the year, uh, we, should have, um, we should have all, uh, there should be no more paper forms in Singapore which haven't been digitized. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're working on right now. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Adrian from uh, CSIT, short for Center for Strategic Infocom Technology. Um, so uh, I'm currently leading the Cybersecurity Research Lab over there. For people who uh, have not heard of CSIT, uh, CSIT is a, a civilian agency in the Ministry of Defense and we uh, do R&D in Infocom as well as uh, in, in cybersecurity. So we deliver technology solutions uh, to basically to meet uh, Singapore's uh, security needs. So for me, day-to-day, uh, -day, my team and I, we will actively uh, hunt and look for uh, security vulnerabilities in, in software and the systems that we use in the government systems. Um, so we, the, the idea is for us to proactively take on the role of an attacker and try to think like an attacker and see and try to uncover all the different security weaknesses that people may have actually overlooked in the, in the software system. And uh, this is uh, one, of the, one of the key things that we actually do is uh, because a lot of the times like the software that we're actually dealing with uh, does not actually come with source code. So that's why many times we actually have to deal, the, deal, deal with the analysis at the uh, uh, underlying machine code and the binary level. Uh, one of the things recently that uh, I'm putting a lot more focus in is uh, uh, trying to apply machine learning techniques uh, to vulnerability discovery, trying to scale up our bug discovery work uh, within, the, uh, within the, the agency itself. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is not easy because a lot of the times uh, we don't actually have the source code and a lot of the information uh, is no longer available without the actual source code itself. So the idea is to try to uh, learn from past examples of uh, known dangerous bugs, uh, create models out of that uh, at the data flow level or the code flow level and then uh, use those kind of models to look for new and similar bugs of the same kind of bug pattern. And that way we will be actually be able to scale that up. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's it. Hi, I'm Henry from Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. So CSA is a relatively new organization comparatively. We are about four years old. Um, we celebrate our birthday on April Fool's Day. In, uh, <laughs> and apparently that is an April Fool. So for me particularly, uh, I'm in the certification body. So what happens is we certify products, security products. Essentially, you work with the product developer, be it hardware manufacturer, software developer. We work through with them on understanding the design, to make, making sure that it is well implemented, and again, there's no vulnerability before we certify it. So, a uh, good thing is, uh, in January this year, Singapore is finally a certificate authorizing nation in the Common Criteria Recognition Arrangement. So, what essentially this means is, a certificate issued in Singapore will now be recognized in 30 other nations. And this really helps our local developer as well. So previously, like, it would have been infeasible for them to subject, to send their products overseas for certification, but, but now they could do it actually in Singapore. And that really helps them in terms of venturing into other overseas markets. So increasingly, I'm working also on Internet of Things. As we know that most of these devices are not really secure. If you come by our booth just right outside, 
we could show you how easy it is to hack an IP camera and a smart lock. So imagine that, I think it's nowadays quite common to install some of these devices at home, and personally I do as well, to monitor my babies. And, uh, but in any case, it's usually a double-edged sword, so an attacker could easily hack into it as well. Understand that who is at home, who is no, when is no, nobody at home, and uh, hack your smart lock, go into your house, raid your stuff, and nobody actually can know about it. And it's worse when, imagine now we have whole block of HDB installed with all these devices. It's going to be a problem. It's going to be a concern. It's going to be something that we want to address. And uh, apart from that, I'm representing Singapore as well in. ISO committees in developing standards. Good afternoon, my name is Chin. I am the group director for both the uh, Smart Nation sensor platform as well as the Pongo Digital District or Smart District. I'll take, talk a little bit more about the sensor platform. Um, very often when you think about a sensor, you have in mind probably a static sensor or IoT device that's stuck somewhere picking up information. Um, what we do is we look at sensor from all types, not only the static ones that you find on smart lampposts that picks up uh, environment data. We're also looking at uh, sensors that are mobile so that we can pick up information while say a robot or a drone is flying about. What we do with this data is essentially we contribute to a big cache or hash uh, group of uh, data which uh, AI techniques and machine learning can be applied. What's useful about um, essentially sensor data is that uh, we are interested about what's happening around us, in this specific case, what's happening around Singapore. So information that essentially comes out from things around us, we pick it up and we collect it and we become the uh, trusted source uh, of information on sensor data regarding Singapore. The other part about it is essentially when you think about sensor data or how we are collecting sensor data, uh, you think of mainland Singapore, which is about 700 plus square kilometers. Our interest is actually to reach out to even the southern islands and effectively mean that we will be pulling data from 1,400 square kilometers instead. We may not realize this, but um, in the Southern Islands, when we include them, Singapore is a little bit bigger. So from uh, the data we collect, um, we want to work with agencies. Um, some of the data that we collect belongs to them. Some of the data we collect belongs to devices uh, from us. Essentially, what we will achieve in our goal by 2022 is to take different sensor information and become the trusted source in which the government and agencies as well as uh, industries can use data to build application on top of it. That's essentially what I do. Thanks. Um, all of you have very different paths that led you to the government. Um, can I get two of you to maybe share a little bit about what drew you to it? Maybe Hongyi, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I started out as a scholar uh, and I originally was not even going to study computer science. Uh, I started out studying economics in college, uh, and then sometime around my third year, um, I was deciding between like computer science and architecture because my brother was an engineer and my sister was an architect. Um, and after spending a few like sleepless nights in the in the architecture studio, I decided to do computer science. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. better air conditioning. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I started out. Uh, I think the main reason so. When I came back, so I went to work for Google for a couple of years after, after graduating. Um, and then I came back, because uh, I was a scholar, I came back uh, and I started work, working at IDA. Um, I think the main thing that drew me to wanting to work in government is this sense that like, like I wanted to do something useful. Because um, my, my, my current working hypothesis essentially is that uh, one of the key problems with the world is that you have a lot of the smartest people are working on the dumbest problems. And so like if you look at, like there are, there are plenty of like you know, valedictorians and smartest people in their class, and business school graduates who go like work at who work uh, work on like artificial intelligence for Candy Crush to try to figure out how to get people to buy more candy and try and try to figure out how to sell people like you know whiskey subscription boxes or whatever. And these are really smart people, and this is the and this is what sort of their contribution to society is. Um, 
And yet, at the meantime, there's a lot of other problems in society that we try to fix. Uh, and that's kind of think where we are. I think, just as a sort of an example, San Francisco is a perfect example of how you have all this intelligence, all this wealth, and all this creativity, and yet the city doesn't work very well because you don't have a very well-functioning sort of like public infrastructure. And it just sort of illustrates how you cannot substitute um, poor government with like private wealth. You just can't. Uh, and that's why I do, and that's what, what draw, 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 draws me to government. I think there's a lot of work to be done, and I think it's the place where you really can make a good difference, yeah. Uh, Chinhua, maybe you can share a little bit about your path, because I think you transitioned much later uh, in your career. Sure. Um, I started my career as a system engineer building flight simulators, um, and then transitioned to work on a project um, when I was at Stanford working with a startup. Uh, it was interesting because that was where I picked up how to handle very large data sets. Um, then I had the opportunity um, to, oh, I guess the entre entrepreneur bug kicked in. And then I started my first company, which I sold in one year. Then, well, I thought it was very clever after that. Uh, and then, then got the itch and started another company, which, uh, which I built over eight years. Essentially, that was um, building out um, cloud services or helping companies move from client services uh, technology into cloud services. Did that for eight years. And then Autodesk bought my company. And then I was uh, had the golden handcuff. Um, I was uh, headhunted for this uh, GovTech, so it was exciting for me to make that transition. Uh, I think what was uh, interesting about it, and I do share what Hong Yi was saying, um, I had always been building for somebody else uh, in that sense. I was building it where I have a product to make some money. I was building a product that helped the shareholders or the quarterly um, uh, numbers were met. But it became interesting when I had opportunity uh, presented where could I take some of the things that I have built, uh, some of the things that I am interested in and then build it for a whole nation. So that uh, was an exciting thought uh, and took me about six months or so before I made the switch and decided that I wanted to uh, contribute in the Smart Nation conversation. What was going through your head in those six months? Um, okay, so um, I think what was the concerns or most people would think is that uh, the government would be very hierarchical. Um, there will probably be a lot of red tape and so on. So. I want to tell you that is absolutely not true, uh, but I will put it with a caveat uh, by saying that um, the government needs the processes in place because you cannot imagine and think about it for a moment. If you're given the resources of the government, wouldn't you want to put some guidance in how some of these things were thought through and processed? So uh, that was something that uh, I learned in, when I started early uh, working for GovTech. And then the other bit was there are a lot of talented people. Um, and you would think that maybe we have some, but so far the people I met in GovTech are really smart. Uh, they do speak their mind. Uh, and they d definitely have uh, ideas they can contribute to the plans that we put in place, uh, not only from the management perspective, but I think also from the little bits they contribute, not only the code or the process, the user experience. Uh, and I think ultimately what struck me as uh, very interesting is that every one of them have the heart for Singapore. They didn't come in because they thought it was just another job. I think a lot of them uh, impressed me that um, they really want to contribute to a country, a country that they felt uh, is worth uh, giving their talent to support. Thank you. Um, would the rest of you on this panel agree? I think you talked a little bit about red tape and bureaucracy. What are some of the things that are maybe a little bit challenging about working um, where you work? Um, so I think um, 
I think we must admit that uh, there's some level of uh, bureaucracy in terms of uh, processes and uh, uh, paperwork because after all we are actually handling and we need proper governance of uh, the public fund. So I, I, I will agree that um, you know, the government actually do move slower than the, uh, the private sector in certain areas. And this is actually tough, uh, especially when we are actually operating in a domain uh, that moves very quickly, such as uh, in cybersecurity. So um, one, one example that I can actually think think of is uh, um, when, when we are trying to sign up for, uh, let's say, a, a training course in, say, a very top premium um, black hat uh, security conference. Um, say we have an, a, a training course that's uh, just released and announced, uh, you know, and then uh, it was just broadcasted over in, in Twitter, and it sold out within like uh, two or three hours. So clearly the, uh, the, um, uh, the procurement uh, and the approval process that we have in government is not gonna cut it, right? So it's not gonna be able to approve and let us like, uh, you know, do the, the actual procurement or signing up of the thing within th two or three hours. But that's it, I think to, to be fair, I think um, we are constantly trying to review the processes that we have uh, to move faster in cases where we can actually do so. And you know, in specifically for this kind of procurement, in uh, cases where you know there will be training courses which are very, very highly sought after and yet uh, very, uh, very hard to actually predict. You know, we, we are trying to sort out a new kind of process that allows us to do that and actually handle something like that. So I say that we uh, have made some improvement in those respects. Henry, any thoughts? Yeah, I do agree that there are some degrees of bureaucracy. Uh, in, in that case, I there's another uh, things that I can be frustrating, and uh, we do our projects from start to end. We need to do procurement as well. We need to uh, arrange many other functions, events, and we have uh, and that's like a regular job, a regular work. And it gets worse when there's a cyber attack. Then basically it means that whatever we're doing at the time, we probably have to drop that response to the incident. And it's challenging. And that's where if you have something good to contribute, you are innovative in helping us solve this issue, please come talk to us. And we are more than keen to engage you on that. You look like you're going to say something. <laughs> um. Yeah, when I first joined the government, it was, uh, it was a very stark contrast from working at Google. Um, worked there for a couple of years, and when you're at Google, you, the, the number one thing that's, I think, good about it is that it's not like, it's not the free food or massages or anything like that. It's this sense of empowerment. That, you know, you are, as part of this organization, suddenly you can implement things that, like, literally hundreds of millions of people use, and you want to do, like, you want to do a UX, you want to do a UX study, you can do a UX study. You want to, you want to go, like, crawl through the logs and find some information, you can pull it out. Um, and you, and you feel like, like you, know, you, do, you, you have all these sort of empowered tools to get all this stuff done. Um, and then I joined the government, and uh, I needed to buy a laptop to do development, and it took me like quite a few weeks to buy a laptop. Um, Non-trivial. So I, I, think, I think the main like, deadlock that occurs uh, that, uh, is, is quite a simple one. Essentially, you start out with a scenario where like, there's a policy or something that causes a fair amount of issues. Uh, and it's, it's usually well known. Like if you, know, if, if you have problems with government policy, we're quite well aware of them. And we work in government, so we hear about it quite well. Um, the problem occurs when like, you want to sort of like, all right, um, uh, try to raise a change to that policy, right? And you want to bring a change to that policy, um, but, you can't, but you're worried about doing that because you know, we run government systems. There's a lot of implications for doing that change. Um, and so you say, okay, uh, we need to do, uh, why don't we do a pilot? Why don't we test it out and see what the implications are, see what the consequences are, so that we can test these consequences and then we can make, them, make the change. And okay, uh, well, you can't, do the, you, can't do the, you can't do the pilot because the policy stops you from doing so. And it just forms this really tight loop. Um, I think the main thing that, uh, the main thing that is a challenge, I think, right now, is this sort of, uh, the government is by design set up to be consistent more than anything else, which is that it's identified a certain mode of operation and then codifies it and writes it into process, writes it into the audit things, and like you sort of streamlines and goes. Um, in fact, we're so, and this is very good if you, want, if you have a, a sort of consistent mode of operation. Um, and so if you're, look, but, and so if you're building like 
buildings, turns out buildings today are built fairly similarly to how they were built 10 years ago and fairly similarly to built 10 years before that. And if you're building software, this is completely untrue. Um, to give you a point, uh, give you an example, uh, in cybersecurity, yes, you want to be secure, you want to be safe. In fact, we're so safe in some areas, we're still using Windows XP. Um, and so that's, that's, clearly a, that's clearly a failure mode. And so there needs to be, I, I think that's the main sort of challenge, which is that you, 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 you're, you're trying to make sure that there's enough, uh, there's enough uh, sort of consistency to make sure that you're not irresponsible. Um, but at the same time, like, you want to make sure, you, like, moving slow is being irresponsible um, at some point. Uh, so I think that is the main challenge that we face right now in the government. Uh, what are some steps that you're taking to overcome or tackle this challenge over time? Yeah, um, I think some things we're doing right now is that we're trying to more clearly demarcate when something's exploratory rather than like soft implementation. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're trying to scale something up to everyone, by definition, you're codifying and scaling. But when you're doing innovation, especially with software, um, the question is not about like how can I implement the thing that people have done a hundred times before. Because if you're implementing software that people have done before, you shouldn't be implementing it. You should just be using the thing someone did before. Um, so. Innovation, especially in digital technology, is about exploration rather than uh, planning. And so you cannot sit in a room and debate about what the right way of doing it is because by definition, there's no content for you to debate around. And so it's more about like clearly identifying that this is a thing that we, we don't know. We know we don't know it. We are going to fail at it. And so rather than like trying not to fail at it hopelessly, um, identifying ways how you can fail as quickly as possible in like small sort of like confined controlled explosions so that you can get the information about what and, and get your information, learn what the right things to do are and then move forward from there. Um, and that is one of the things we're doing. Um, I want to take the conversation in a slightly different direction. So over lunch, I spoke to a couple of different people and I asked them you know, what they were concerned about when it comes to moving to Singapore. And there were two things. So one of the things was if you move to Singapore, it might be very difficult to move back to Silicon Valley. And the second thing as it relates to the government was if I move into the government, it might be very difficult to move back into the private sector afterwards. Um, so I'm curious if you have uh, a take on that, whether that's true. And if it's not true, are there counter examples? I've been in government now about five and a half years, uh, and I think I think it is to some extent true if you don't make the effort uh, to, to to sort of like distinguish yourself. Because uh, to give an example, um, having worked at Google is very very good for your future career. It opens a lot of doors just straight up, just because you have that pedigree and like you want to apply for jobs. You can. It's easy to have a conversation with someone. At least that. At least to get your foot in the door. Um, that being said, it doesn't help you in interviews. You actually do need to like, if, especially if you're doing tech interviews, like going through that software, like being able to solve software problems is still that challenge. Um, looking at people from our team, like we've had several people from our team uh, like who've moved on and have gotten very good jobs in the private sector. So, and so they, they came to join us, first job out of school, and now they're off working at, uh, I think, Airbnb, at Grab, at Stripe, at, you know, and so on and so forth. And so it's, it's I mean, empirically, it is true that it's definitely possible. Um, I think if you're applying for, let's put it this way, if you're applying to companies which aren't very good at hiring engineers, then they use very poor metrics. And they're like, does this guy have the right degree? Does he work at this company? And they sort of like just feel around in the dark and basically go off like hearsay on what, what a good engineer is. If you're applying to real engineering companies, and when I say real engineering companies, I mean companies which actually give you a coding interview to test to see if you're any good, um, then they don't really care. Um, like maybe you need something on your resume just to show that you've worked as a software engineer before and you need to do some kind of online test and if you get, uh, but like once you get, once you get into the interview room, like pretty much it's just you. Uh, and yeah, the work we do in government is, is challenging. There is a lot of it and it is just as complicated, if not, not more so in all scenarios as the private sector. Um, Henry, would you agree with that? Any? Yeah, I think cybersecurity, uh, particularly for, for us, cybersecurity is now the hot topic. It's something that you read in the papers every day. Like somebody got hacked, somebody got compromised. It's, everybody's trying to protect it. So it's already a sexy job in today's times. And if you work in cybersecurity agency of Singapore, which is the national authority, it's even uh, something that is a plus point on your resume. So there's no lack of job opportunities. Um, I, but personally for me, I like, receive like LinkedIn requests from headhunters. Like, are you interested in this job, interested in that job? So I think getting a job elsewhere after joining the government is never constant. I guess uh, uh, 
uh, just to just to add, um, so I, I guess there's this sense that you know uh, I'm I'm going to be working for a government, and then you know uh, if you're working on certain things, and there's some sensitivity in the kind of stuff that you do, and then you when you want to go out and uh, get employed, and you won't be able to actually tell people stuff. But I guess for cybersecurity, um, um, yeah, so it's it is a very hot area right now. But in fact, a lot of the skills that we pick up along the way, in, uh, in even in government work, while the subject matter is actually sensitive. Um, but skills are actually extremely uh, transferable. So for example, in, like, uh, uh, in the course of us being able to do like vulnerability research and assessments of the, the systems where we have to take apart like the software and the networks and all, uh, even like the binary analysis uh, where we do reverse engineering or that, it will come perfectly uh, useful in a lot of the security uh, vendor companies that you get these days where they do like, for example, places like um, malware analysis and things like that. And uh, yeah, um, I think it, on, on the, yeah, I get a lot of uh, LinkedIn requests too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so very compelling points, but what happens if people are not ready to move back yet? Um, is there anything that they can do from here to help you? Um, are there ways that you collaborate with the private sector? So cybersecurity is a difficult problem. So I mean, we, and it is something that we can't do it on our own. We definitely rely on partners, rely on the ecosystem. If we are developing unique solution that can help better protect our system, our infrastructures, our network, definitely we are interested. We have a specialist, specialized skill set, something you know, something we don't, or perhaps we are not as good as you, let us know. And we are more than willing to work with you. Um, on the product development side, uh, so a few things you can do. Uh, first is, uh, one, if you are just willing to share and give talks and talk to and, and like, like just be part of the community and help us be involved in the community, I think that's very, very useful. Uh, one of the things I think is uh, problematic uh, is if, let's say, government tech gets off like, you know, pigeonholed away from pub, uh, from the private sector, right? Because, turn, because you know, if you if you isolate yourself in tech, you basically die because it is it is but it is an industry that has to move forward, and you have to keep up with what everyone else is doing. And so, if you're willing to like, you know, if you're back in Singapore and you want to give a talk, or you want to come like come to some of our meetups, and you want to come just share like the work you do, or even have like have us ask you questions on like the things you do, I think that's very, very useful and it will be tremendously useful for us to sort of see how you and all your various like private roles and all the companies and all the things that we do here, um, what we can learn from that. Um, in a bit more sort of like engaged me mechanism, uh, turns out like just from my personal experience, most of the things we build don't actually use very many government systems. In fact, half my time is arguing why the app we built should be built entirely outside of our government infrastructure um, because it's just faster to build. And so a lot of the things that we build that are public, uh, that serve the public, actually can be built entirely without being a government employee if you have time. Um, so this is a more of like, you know, if you have time on the weekend sort of thing. But if you want to build, for example, an app to help people uh, choose schools, um, and you think the MOE's website doesn't provide the right information or you could be combined with other information or there's some other criteria or there's a better filter or something like that, you can put that together um, because you, and that turns out to help quite a lot of people. There are a lot of ways how people even not in the government can build public serving um, apps and services. Uh, and it, depending, on, like, and because it is such an uncontested space, um, chances are if you build something you saw, people will use it and, you will, and you'll be quite appreciative. Um, yeah, and I guess finally the last thing would be like if you, uh, we have like sort of like smaller ways in which people can be engaged. Uh, we have our Smart Nation Fellowship where like you can come for like six months and just to see whether or not you feel like working in Singapore and the government for a while. Um, and even less than that, you can just like, we have a lot of mentorship programs where we connect sort of our government, uh, our government, uh, our government sort of fresh grads with people who have worked in the industry for many years just so that they can learn and know that developing in the right channels. I was going to add a couple of points. Um, I think Singapore has a tremendous <laughs> reputation when it comes to smart cities and smart nation conversation. So what would be attractive, obviously, for all of you is, um, for especially those who are Singaporeans, when you come back and Singapore once a year, Chinese New Year, whatever, do drop by, talk to us at GovTech. I think we we'll probably be able to show you something that you will be surprised. Um, I think that conversation we would like to have with you when you do come back and do visit us. The second thing uh, I think is also, it's a very personal choice and it's obviously depending in uh, which cycle or which part of your life you're in. But I would certainly encourage uh, there are opportunities for you to try even. Uh, GovTech Fellowship is one example. 
and also to make friends with, um, say, for, for us who sit here. Like, come talk to us personally, uh, share your thoughts, uh, what, uh, which part of your career you're at, and what is it that you are aspiring to, to be an individual contributor to manage. Um, there is many opportunities, and those opportunities uh, are available uh, and for you to figure out your talents and how you can contribute to where Singapore can be. I think in the um, long run, um, don't lose that link, right? Uh, I have lived in US for a while. Um, I know what, what's it like. Uh, people always say Singapore is the most expensive city, but you know it's not true. You live in San Francisco, right? <laughs> <laughs> So take, take the monetary bits out. Um, we have a nation, uh, we have a culture worth preserving. I think uh, your talents and your ability to make the nation not only smart, uh, but also a nation that is caring, a nation that is meant for every citizen uh, that can contribute to the neighbor, I think that's important. And if you do have a heart for that, uh, we certainly want to have that conversation with you because there are so many things we can do about it. To come and visit CSA and CSIT as well. <laughs> yeah. And I'll attract you with another perk. We are located in, in Maxwell Road. I'm sure you miss the good food. <laughs> so we have many Michelin Bib stores in Amoy and Maxwell Hockey Center. So make that an incentive when you come to speak to us. I guess, uh, just to add a little bit more, um, uh, help us spread the word, uh, even though, let's say, you might not be ready to actually come back uh, to Singapore. Um, I guess if you are, you are interested in, uh, you're very, very passionate about like, cybersecurity, especially in the areas of uh, vulnerability research, pen testing, malware analysis, and data analytics, uh, for example, I think we're very open to also collaborating in terms of that, um, say, training, as well as uh, having like a, a remote, short-term uh, research uh, project that we can kind of like arrange um, uh, between the agency and you. So I think we are very, very open to this kind of collaboration opportunity as well. So this is something to also keep in mind. And uh, yeah, so you can swing by uh, our, the, the booth after the, uh, during the happy hour, and then we can talk more about that. Thanks. Um, I just want to be mindful of time and open up uh, the floor for questions if anyone has some to ask our panelists. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Jen. I'm a graduate So uh, I don't think any of us work at the at the power at SP uh, Sing Power, but um, just to give you like orders of magnitude about things that we can do. Uh, I think if you're looking at until uh, a lot of a lot of our energy expenditure is just due to inefficiency. Um, human beings at like a base level don't actually require that much power. Um, things like selectively like knowing when to cool, so simple things like if you can selectively turn on on and off air conditioning as and when you need it and not just leave it running the whole day. That's a fairly useful thing, fairly trivial to do. Um, similarly for in terms of optimizing like like for your uh, for vehicles, right? Um, electric cars are taking off in Singapore, they're working reasonably well. Um, we have trying to build infrastructure around that. It costs quite a bit to manufacture but you know that's part of the cost. Um, a big part of our energy expenditure and this is not from my role as an engineer but like just from my like general social studies, um, is underst I understand is in manufacturing. Um, and so the ability to optimize there depends a lot on the differences in manufacturing processes. Uh, whether or not we use like renewables or not is sort of neither here nor there um, in that case because it's just, well, that's what you need in order to build the thing. Um, and what will matter is that whether or not we have the space and infrastructure in order to build other kinds of resources. Um, unfortunately, empirically, I think right now it seems that most of the renewable energy options in Singapore are not viable. So um, yes, you could imagine you could do something with solar, but solar panels turns out to be very, very expensive. If you account for the energy to manufacture the solar panels, the net energy, the net energy output of the solar panels is actually not that high. Um, 
Uh, if you account for, like, they've looked at tidal, uh, tidal energy generation, but I don't think those, I, again, I don't think that amount of energy you can get from it uh, compensates for the amount of energy requiring to build the system. Um, and I don't think wind is viable in Singapore either. So at least that's my sort of, like, layman and base understanding of it. I hope that answers your question. My question I have is about moving the government infrastructure to the commercial cloud. I think it was mentioned earlier in the keynote address by Trouble as well. There was 60 to 70 percent of a target 60 to 70 percent of government infrastructure we moved to a commercial cloud. I wanted to ask, like, what are considerations that goes into deciding or not whether or not a system gets moved to a commercial cloud? And in terms of a security point of view, um, do you feel like a commercial cloud is inferior or superior to the government, the current government infrastructure? I was, um, so I just want to uh, make uh, a comment to your comment about whether it's inferior or superior. It's not a matter of whether commercial cloud is uh, superior or that the government cloud is inferior. It's all to do with the sensitivity of the data. So because there are efficiencies and by the technology provided by commercial clouds, we should take advantage of those. And for those, we will uh, use uh, them in the context of whether it's unclassified or classified data. Or in this uh, context, perhaps uh, unclassified and restricted. Uh, for those that are government cloud, there is a certain uh, governance in required for those. And we want to make sure that uh, those are followed. There are certain security policies that are mandated. Um, you know that when we put a smart nation platform or services that's built by Singapore government, we are already a target for hackers, not just because they want to make money of it, just for bragging rights, right? That they took something out of us. So very much in the context of that is about security, where we put the data. So where commercial cloud makes sense and the data is not um, in a sense sensitive, we can put it there where if they are sensitive, we will try to keep it within the government. So it depends a lot on the threat model. Um, if you're talking about like just average hackers, the commercial cloud people are probably better. Uh, like Amazon and Google and Microsoft, they have tons of data centers, they have tons of people, attack they have like giant teams knowing how to secure them. And if you're talking about just a run of the mill, like average people trying to compromise your data centers, like AWS data centers are pretty, are, are pretty solid. Uh, the question is whether or not you're vulnerable. The, 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 the threat, but the, the threat model where the commercial cloud breaks down is when you're talking about three-letter foreign governments. Um, because, you know, yes, they can protect against some average like black hat guy running around, but like if someone comes to the door with a gun, you know, they have to comply because they are part of that country and a part of that governance structure. And that's the main reason that you are, and that's the main sort of like separation. If I'm only worried about whether or not some uh, some like pirate is going to try and attack, attack my server, sure, commercial cloud's fine, probably better than anything else. In fact, probably more secure than the stuff we build ourselves. Um, if we're worried about, but the main threat model is that like if, I, if, I have, if I'm using a cloud provider and they are under a certain country's jurisdiction, if that country brings guns to their door and insists on giving them the data, there's nothing much they can do. And that's why it's not really, it's not really about whether one is more or less secure, it's about what the threat model is. Yeah. yeah, and basically, like uh, for commercial companies, like uh, in our companies, that like, many of the SMEs, they probably would not have the competency and capability or the resources to build their own data center to secure it. And perhaps commercial cloud will be a better option for them. For many of the startups, where many of these are like, AWS, Google, have more security measures to keep them more protected than having to do it themselves. Hi, Pedro. Uh, we're currently working at the cybersecurity center. Um, it's a two-part question. The first part is like, what are some products you feel like you're proud of that the government tech has created that has impacted life in Singapore? Um, the second part is how do you feel like government tech as well as the cybersecurity agencies measure success um, in, when it comes to products? Is it like the reach or like how do you measure impact and success? Sure. Uh, so thing I am, things I am most proud of right now, uh, I am most proud of forms because I think it's going to be the main thing that like if you get the government to go paperless, that's a pretty big deal. And it, we've done so in, I think it's what I think is a fairly novel way. We've implemented sort of zero, a zero knowledge system where the server never sees the data, which means it, I mean, it's not hack proof, but it's far more resilient than a normal way of storing data. Um, and, and we've also implemented, a, and just from a pure technical perspective, uh, we've also implemented um, Shamir secret sharing, if you know what that is. It's where you take a key and you split it into um, K, N parts, and any K of those key parts can regenerate the original key, which has the nice semantic of being able to sort of like 
meet the government need of having multiple Google approvals while no single point of failure, et cetera, et cetera. So fairly sophisticated, technically uh, hits a big use case, and so I'm quite proud of that. Other things we're proud of, um, we are uh, we are currently working on uh, we are currently working on some like similar data sharing systems for within government, uh, which implements sort of similar security semantics and will scale quite easily. And if we get if we get all this stuff in, if we get if we can get to a stage where like government agencies like people have this like weird idea. No, I don't. Think, I, I understand where it comes from. People have this idea that the government is like this big brother thing where we we know everything about you and can track you and know what you do. Like speaking as the government technology agency, trying to get data from literally any other agency it takes months and like it's really, really hard. And so if I can get to a stage where I can get data between government agencies, like as easily I can get data from someone I know and just like email it over, like that would be wonderful. Um, so that, in terms of measured success, uh, measured success is a pretty hard thing to do. Uh, and yeah, I could argue about like specific metrics or specific like, uh, like, like you know, whether or not I should, I should go by usage or numbers or all the but like generally speaking, it's how much people voluntarily use your stuff uh, and how much pain it solves. Um, so if you go by pure installs, like there's a lot of crappy apps that we force everyone to install like you know, um, all, all across the nation and you don't, you don't really count those. Uh, so you should, you should look at the like apps that people voluntarily use and whether or not it addresses a key pain point. So, uh, but even that has its own metric that you have a problem with. For example, it, uh, you know, Candy Crush is a very, 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 very big successful app. So you have to take, I think, a value, a more value judgment of like, based on whether or not people are using this, have I added value to society? And so if your hypothesis is that this is a very big thing and these are all the potential people who I think would use and would solve their problem, have I solved that problem? And if they're not using it, then you probably haven't. Uh, so. Our metrics, at least, so for data.gov, the original metric, I think, for success was number of data sets on the platform, which resulted in us having 13,000 data sets. We now are at, and after a lot of work, we've got that down to 2,000, because it turns out when you give a KPI around number of data sets, people start splitting data sets into arbitrarily small parts, and like you get 13,000 completely useless things. And so now our metric is a uh, number of, like, I think, a uh, number of monthly, uh, monthly actives, um, which I think is a slightly better metric. And we just have to have the discipline to not like go full BuzzFeed and like try to optimize purely for monthly actives. But like, it is a rough indicator of whether or not you are doing a good job. Yep. Uh, my name is Tian Yang. I currently work here in the Bay Area. And just wanted to ask a question with regards to choice. Um, how we, if they were to go back, Singapore work How we get to choose the kind of products that are interested in and under what kind of you know, priorities you rank them in your awards? Okay, so I can, I'll, I'll talk about GovTech. Uh, I don't want to talk about CRCRCRT, but basically, uh, there's a few ways you can take a look at it. Um, uh, so there are the big, so there are there are sort of successive levels of hierarchy in the kinds of projects that go. There are the bigger blocky projects, which like we have declared at National Day Rally, and we we shall do this as a as a as a nation, uh, and that sort of like takes up a big short, short set of resources, and that, that's the kind of big things that people want to work. On. Um, well, that, that big things that people want to allocate their engineers to, and so just purely statistically speaking, there's a good chance you'll be working on one of these projects. Um, and there's a, quite a few to choose from. Uh, Chao Ho presented earlier, like you know, there's like national digital infrastructure, there's the moments of life, there's you know, there's a bunch of these. Um, at the lower level, there's the stuff which like I as like a team lead tell my team I think this is a good project and we should go do it. Uh, and like I'll, I'll identify things which I think are opportunities and we'll put together and I'll get a, I'll, I'll get some guys who have some free cycles. They have uh, they have a pro, uh, we'll put together a prototype and I'll sort of like roughly direct what to build and then we'll take them and we'll go shop at the agencies. At the lower level, uh, we do a hackathon, for example, uh, it, uh, something individually driven. So uh, at least for my team, we do a hackathon every January, uh, like literally a month of January. We stop all non-critical work and we just like hack on new projects that we think have new opportunities. And like I would say about half of our current projects are things that the team came up with and thought would be useful. Examples of things that an individual came up with and thought would be useful are like colorized SG because you know it turns out colorizing photos is fairly neat and is useful for archival purposes. Um, uh, we have uh, an app for people to like. It's called Trashy. It helps people find trash, recy like, trash recycling like bins uh, around the island. It's just a map. It's a fairly simple app. Um, but again, come, came from the team. Um, stuff like that. Uh, like, and so it, it depends on like, really what you're looking for. Uh, if you, you want to work on like, big, chunky projects, then you basically go talk, to the, you go talk to the director. I guarantee you that if you want to work for them, they are more than happy to take you. There's no director in cross government who'll be like, no, no, I have enough engineers. No, they're they more than happy to take you. Um, if you want to have, if you want to like, but if you have a particular drive or a particular area of kind of thing problems you want to work on, um, 
you should find a manager who like understands that and will give you the space to push from these things. I think there's a fair amount of space within government to like initiate projects. We try to like let people drive like, it's just, I we call it tech push where instead of it being a policy driven decision and then we build it, uh, it comes from people who build the technology and then we try to see, and then we try to see if there's a use case and benefit around that. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of different ways. Um, I don't know how it is at CS, uh, CSA or, or CSIT. Yeah, for CSA, I think it's really matter of what your interest is in a sense because we deal with production, we deal with detection, we deal with response. You know, some people like they watch too much drama, they think that CSI is very cool, they like to do malware reverse engineering, they like to be in response, they want to find out what happened when to the bridge, how it happened, and that's what kind of like, attracts them, motivates them. For some others, uh, they talk about that like, they want to analyze threat, they want to foresee potential future trends, and that's where they go into like, doing detection kind of work, analysis kind of work. And for me, I'm more in the protection kind of house. I try to do implement system, try to get make sure things are secure from the onset. And, but in any case, we know that nowadays it's not quite possible to be entirely protected. We are no longer talking about total protection, but we are talking about resilient. In the event of attack, how fast can you recover from an attack? and get out with lives, and that's more important in that sense. So ultimately, it really depends on your interests, your key uh, competencies, and how you can contribute to the whole um, spectrum. Thanks. Last question. Um, well, the short story is that uh, with CSIT, we produce a lot of the, uh, the, the techniques as well as a lot of projects that we actually created. Um, the, 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 well, the short answer is that we don't actually op open source that. Um, but uh, internally, when we're actually evaluating and uh, creating solutions uh, in, in, within the agency, um, we evaluate, we draw inspiration from uh, not just in the industry as well as uh, we also get it from like the a academia as well. So a lot of the, uh, the techniques where we want to try to explore uh, requires us to uh, play around and explore uh, some of the open source stuff that, uh, let's say the academia people, uh, they, would, uh, they would actually publish that as a, as a part of a proof of concept uh, from the, the papers that they publish in, in, in the academic uh, conferences. So in those cases, we will actually draw upon those uh, and then play around with that. Uh, but uh, so far, we haven't actually had a, an instance where we uh, we did the modification and uh, actually open source it back in, in, into the community, at least in the CSIT. Um, in, Gov, uh, F, in GovTech, we use quite a lot of open source technology, um, like a hell of a lot. Uh, so data.gov is built on CCAN, which is an open source sort of like, you know, data, data management thing. Uh, Forms.sg is built on Telform. Uh, it, we used it as the basis and then we modified it heavily to where it is today. Um, and like virtually every, and so like Parking SG, for example, is built on React Native, which is again open source. Um, and it's built on, you know, it, it's built using a whole bunch of various other tools. Um, in terms of APIs, yeah, we, we basically go APIs by default. Virtually all of our systems, rather than build as of these monolithic like, um, monolithic like clients, are split into server servers with APIs, and then client as a the client is a separate repo which talks through the API. So theoretically, you can have multiple clients talking to the same uh, to the same backend um, quite straightforwardly, and that's and just by default. And so, uh, for example, with the parking app, uh, the APIs are open. So actually, one uh, one service actually implements implements parking as well using our same APIs. Um, then. Uh, and in terms of like open sourcing our stuff, um, my uh, because we don't work on anything sensitive, our stance is that public money, public code. Um, so we open source almost as much as possible. Like not a lot, our stuff isn't like very, very fairly useful to most people because it's like a very specific government public context. Uh, but we're hoping that other countries will look at the stuff we use and find it interesting. So data.gov, for example, we've spoken with the Taiwanese, uh, the Taiwanese teams and the Australian teams, I believe, who are working on data. Gov.au and you know Taiwan. Um, I think it's TW. I believe I can't remember. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and you know they they, t they take a look at the code, and um, you know if you look at uh, data.gov.my, it turns out it looks quite similar to ours. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the permanent secretary from Smart Nation Group who's going to talk. Yeah, uh, given that there's so much interest, I I thought I would say some things very quickly. Uh, 
with say something honestly, quickly, so that you can judge for yourself what it is like to maybe work in the government. Uh, in the first place, GovTech is a 2,100 person organization and it's very diverse. Much more so than say a technology company of 2,100 people which would be much more specific, much more focused in its products, much more specific, much more focused in its market that it wants to target. GovTech does a lot more things than a typical 2,000 person company. But as a result of that, uh, there are pros and cons. The pros is that you can have a wide range of things that you could do just moving within the organization. But at the same time, the culture within the organization may not necessarily be as coherent as a very focused technology company. When externally you're focused on serving a very small segment of the population, internally you're also more coherent uh, in a range of culture, in a range of the sort of people that you work with. So, I mean, in GovTech, you have somebody like Hong Yi who is like at the age of the envelope, but you know, you have lots of people who, um, uh, I guess, uh, not so at the cutting edge, la, if you see what I mean. <laughs> uh, unlike a tech, tech company where if you are very focused, you, you, internally you'll be very coherent as well. Uh, then across the government, uh, we have put in a play, uh, 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 we have put in a, a structure where GovTech uh, as a whole, or maybe me as PS Smart Nation Digital Government has an influence over how technology is deployed across the government. For those of you who are in the uh, army who are familiar with how the army is organized, the chief signal officer has an uh, influence over how signal officers are deployed all across the army, regardless of which division you are and so on and so forth. And within the government, we are working towards something like that. So just now for the gentleman who asked, if you want to join the Singapore government, where, where will you work in and all that? You can start anywhere. And you have a chance of being posted to anywhere else you would like uh, as you discover more of what you actually do like. So it is very porous across uh, the government. And more than that, uh, beyond the government, within Singapore, we are also developing an ecosystem. And that's why you see in a forum like that, it isn't just a government forum, even though it's paid for by the government. There's active uh, private sector participation. Because we believe that if you ever wanted to go back to Singapore, you won't be just interested in one specific job. You won't be just in, be interested in one specific next job. But if you don't like the next job or you want to move on from the next job after a few years, that there should be enough of an ecosystem within Singapore that you're interested in, whether it's within government, across the government, into private sector. And in the private sector, there, there are startups, there's SMEs, there are local big companies, there are MNCs. But the fourth layer is actually beyond Singapore, which is to the region. So whether the region, you reach it through Singapore companies who are investing heavily, we are the biggest FDI source of funds investing into China. We are the biggest source of FDI funds investing into Indonesia. So there will be regional presence of companies that you work with as well. Moreover, uh, increasingly, you have regional companies who base themselves out of Singapore that you can also, through internal posting, get to work in the region. So of the four unicorns that uh, Singapore based, uh, actually work widely in the region. Three are actually not even Singapore owned. So there are lots of opportunities within government in Singapore across to the private sector as well as regionally. I thought I, I should say that so that you understand that we, we are not working in a very narrow way. We are quite interested in you coming back uh, at some point because there's a rich ecosystem. Um, so lots of questions. I think they'll be hanging out for a happy hour and you're welcome to keep uh, asking them questions. Thank you. Thank you.